Hello, everyone, and welcome. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Office of the Associate Director for Policy, is pleased to present this introductory webinar series on thinking in systems. My name is James Cope. I'm a health scientist with the Office of the Associate Director for Policy, and I'm serving as host for this webinar series. For any questions following this presentation, please contact us at the following email address, healthpolicynews at cdc.gov. Our guest facilitator today is Steve Peterson, who has deep experience applying the thinking and systems approach in a broad range of settings, between teaching, research, and consulting. We will also be joined by Dr. Jennifer Kaminsky of CDC's National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disorders. With that, I'd like to introduce Steve and thank him for being here today. Hello. And welcome to the third and final in a set of three webinars in which you'll be introduced to the thinking in systems approach. This webinar is titled Applying the Framework. In this session, we'll walk you through a couple of case studies in which the thinking in systems framework was applied to better understand public health issues and to begin to provide insight into productive policy responses. I'm Steve Peterson, and I'll be leading these webinars. I've been a practitioner of this stuff for over 35 years, and my aim in leading the webinars is to help you develop your skills so that you can use the thinking in systems approach to gain insight into public health issues and improve public health outcomes. Let's get started. It's important to start with a few acknowledgments and disclaimers. I'm the primary developer of the content for the first two webinars, and I developed the first case study that you'll be seeing today. When I draw from work done from others, I'll acknowledge that effort on the relevant slide. And it's important to note that the funding for this webinar was made possible by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and Change Lab Solutions under cooperative agreement that you see here. The findings and conclusions of this presentation and are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official position of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Before we dig into the content, I'd like to give you a bit of an overview, both of the series and of this particular webinar. One way to clarify what we're aiming to do in this series is to start with purpose. What are we trying to do here? The purpose of these sessions is straightforward. We're aiming to use these three webinars to help you build your skills in using what I'm calling the thinking in systems approach. This approach has been around for a long time. We recently celebrated the 60th anniversary of the founding of System Dynamics, which provides the analytical underpinnings for the approach, and it has great value in supporting productive thinking about public health issues. In the first webinar, we focused on some of the fundamental components of the tool set. You learned about the thinking and systems process, and you gained a bit of insight and practice using the supporting skill set. Central to that skill set is the use of stocks and flows to represent the underlying structure of a dynamic process, and then using the map that you create to think about how the problem behavior evolves over time. In the second webinar, we outlined a set of approaches that I found to be very helpful as conversation starters. These conversation starters can help you to gain traction in thinking physically and operationally about public health issues. In my experience, these approaches are effective when you're working on your own. They can be very effective in a group setting as well. If you're watching the recording of this webinar and haven't yet spent time with the first two sessions, I'd encourage you to do so now. These webinars build on one another, and we'll be drawing on the skills developed in the previous webinars during this session. In today's session, we'll be focusing on a set of real-world contexts. We'll be using the thinking and systems approach to gain insight into some challenging public health issues. Today, we'll show how the thinking and systems approach can be used to improve understanding of real-world systems problems, and you'll get a better sense for how the approach might be used to stimulate policy responses. Our intent is to be as hands-on as possible. And if previous experience in workshops is to be a guide, and I've run a lot over the years, these sessions are likely to be pretty intense as you work with what may be new concepts and ideas. Today, for example, you may feel a bit like you're taking a drink from a fire hydrant. This stuff is like many topics. You can learn about thinking in systems by listening, 
But your learning journey may not take you very, very far. To learn to think in systems, you really need to engage in the process of building stock and flow maps and then relating these to the dynamics of a policy issue. Given the constraints of this webinar approach, this will be a challenge. One way for you to overcome that challenge is to work with me. So take a minute now and get out a pad of paper and a couple of sharp pencils. You'll need them. This presentation draws from public health examples to illustrate key concepts of thinking in systems. But you should keep in mind that these are just examples for teaching purposes, and the concepts are generalizable to any topic of interest. Today's agenda is straightforward. We'll start with a very quick review of where we've come over the previous two webinars. This will help you to scrape away any rust that may have accumulated on your brain cells since last time. Then we'll walk through two case studies. The first case study looks at eating disorders among adolescent females. It's an adaptation of some student work from my class in the last year. The second case study relates to access and affordability of care for families with young children who have mental, behavioral, or developmental disorders. This second case study, led by Dr. Jennifer Kaminsky of the CDC, summarizes some outcomes from a workshop in the Thinking and Systems approach that we conducted earlier this year. To wrap up, I'll offer a few quick wrap-up thoughts. Okay, so let's do a quick review of where we've been in this webinar series. Why might you consider adopting a thinking in systems mindset? Well, one way to think about this is to consider the nature of systems problems. I like to think about systems problems as having some important and common characteristics. Among them, dynamics in the sense that they involve change over time. They're often driven by multiple interdependent players, often with diverse interests. These interdependencies cross multiple boundaries. They cross geographic boundaries across communities, they can cross functional boundaries within an organization or community, and they can cross areas of expertise when you want to understand what's going on in the system. Because of the dynamic complexity involved, it can be really difficult to communicate the essence of what's causing systems problems, and it can be extremely difficult to engage productive communication around effective policy responses. Now, if you think about the big and many of the smaller problems in public health, it seems clear that they fit into this class that I'm calling systems problems. Remember the list that we generated in the very first webinar? It had topics including youth violence, opioid abuse, Zika virus, and growing resistance to antibiotics. These problems are pervasive. You don't need to look far to find a systems problem. They're tough nuts to crack in the sense that they're difficult to understand and difficult to sustainably resolve. We need tools that can help us to appropriately frame issues as system issues to see the system's natures of these issues. We need tools that can support rigorous thinking about how the structure of a system, how it's put together, can give rise to the dynamics that we're seeing while productively bringing together and synthesizing multiple perspectives and multiple disciplines. My experience over the past 30 plus years in working with this stuff is that the thinking in systems approach has great potential to help in framing issues in thinking about dynamics, and in facilitating stakeholder engagement. In the first webinar, I walked through a very simple example that used the approach to provide a sense for this potential. And in the second webinar, we used a set of conversation starters to show how the approach could be used to improve thinking around a sustainability issue for developing areas. What is it? Well, there are multiple differing definitions of systems thinking. Here's how I tend to think about it. Systems thinking, thinking in systems, is a design-focused process that consists of three major stages, sharpening the focus, developing a map, and testing the thinking. These stages reinforce one another. Throughout, you're working to interact with stakeholders to advance the thinking. A practical skill set supports the process. Essential best practices within this skill set include dynamic thinking, operational thinking, expanding the boundary of inquiry, feedback thinking, and evidence-based action taking. While there are many permutations, 
as you'll see if you dig into the search results on the phrase systems thinking. People who tend to be effective in thinking in systems tend to use a process like the one outlined here, and they tend to use the skill set outlined here to gain insight. We talked in the first webinar about the importance of learning by doing. Even if you have a day job, you can build your skills in thinking and systems by practicing low-impact aerobics and by being cognizant of the boundaries and working to expand them and by sharing your thinking with others. In the second webinar, we talked about the challenges in getting started with creating a map, either on your own or in a group setting. I presented a set of conversation starters. They're shown here that, in my experience, can help to get things going. The first set of conversation starters is behavioral in focus, behavior over time, or BOT graphs. The second set of starters is structural in focus. Main chains are configurations that dynamically distribute or allocate stuff among a set of stocks. We walked through four different variations on this main chain theme. Here, I've shown a sample of each. As you practice using bot graphs and main chains to think about systems issues, you'll get better at it, especially as you talk through your thinking with others and as you connect your maps to available evidence. And it's important to note that even as a long journey begins with a single step, it's possible to develop some pretty sophisticated and comprehensive system maps through the use of the simple tools that I presented in the first two webinars. You don't have to build something that's hugely complex, but it's good to note that it's possible to develop a rich framework for thinking about a systems issue using some simple tools. Okay, so let's look at some application areas and walk through some case studies. We'll start with a case study that focuses on eating disorders among adolescent females. This case study is adapted from a student project in my course last winter. Many of us know or know of someone who has struggled with an eating disorder, and it can be devastating for all involved. The student, Maya Raghavan, was motivated to understand both the depth of the problem, how much of this iceberg was below the surface and therefore difficult to observe, as well as the potential for increasing effective treatment for those who have an eating disorder. I've adapted and built upon her project work to create this study, which focuses on a hypothetical small city. To provide an initial focus for the effort, consider a hypothetical small city of about 60,000 people. In this city, at any point in time, there are about 3,000 females aged 13 to 18. For this city, what does the iceberg look like, both above and below the surface? How might we develop a plausible estimate of the number of people who are at risk or undiagnosed with an eating disorder? And where is the leverage for improving the situation? Initially, we could focus on a time frame of 2015 to 2025. This would enable us to anchor the thinking in some evidence, and it also enables us to think about how quickly we might be able to change the dynamics of the situation. Given this initial focus, how do we get going? This is where conversation starters can be extremely useful. A good conversation starter is to sketch out a behavior over time graph. A bot graph often helps to expose gaps in our thinking and can facilitate very productive conversations in a group setting. I think that's the case here. Take a minute and think about how you would use a bot graph to think about this problem. What would you put on the x-axis? And what would your sketch look like? What questions come to your mind as you develop your bot? If you're working in a group context, how might that conversation be turbocharged by what gets sketched? Take a minute now and sketch out a graph. I'll wait here for you. Here's an initial sketch that might be helpful. One of the challenges in this hypothetical community 
is that there really isn't any good and easy, easily available data from which to build a sketch. In this case, an online search reveals an academic paper that discusses the prevalence of eating disorders among adolescents, and it's based on a national survey. What's interesting about this paper is that it provided information that's indicative of the overall prevalence of eating disorders, including both diagnosed and undiagnosed cases. So if the national data is representative of the community in question, and this would be a good question to pursue, the paper might give us a sense for the overall size of the iceberg. Note that in the sketch, I've drawn out both a desired and a feared future behavior. There can be some great thinking and discussions around this sort of prospective bot graph. At least initially, let's assume that the prevalence of eating disorders in our hypothetical community is similar to those national estimates. Here's some more data from the academic paper. This is interesting, and it helps to shed some light on the size of the iceberg, both above and below the surface. Of those who had an eating disorder, only a small fraction had been treated for that disorder. And another slice of the population is subthreshold, that is, not quite meeting the diagnostic criteria for an eating disorder, but potentially still at risk for health problems. If our hypothetical community is reflective of these numbers, then it could be that the vast majority of adolescent females who have an eating disorder are below the waterline with regard to treatment. Doing some simple algebra, one might estimate that perhaps 250 adolescent females in the community either meet diagnostic criteria or are subthreshold and therefore at risk with about a 50-50 split between those two categories. And if only 16% of those with a disorder had been treated, then most of the problem in this community is below the waterline. As I was thinking about the data on the previous slide, in the back of my head, I was asking myself, how can I think about the different accumulations that are suggested by these data? What are the activities, the flows that can fill and drain those accumulations? Can I develop a main chain that captures the essence of the movement toward eating disorder diagnosis and treatment? I wonder. Were you beginning to visualize in your mind's eye a stock and flow map? Here's an initial main chain that might get things going. This three stock structure, and I'll often start with three stocks, captures adolescent females who are first without an eating disorder, with an eating disorder but undiagnosed, and then finally with a disorder and diagnosed and treated. The flows in this main chain represent a progression from one stage to the next. This is a pretty good start, but it has some problems. First, there may not be enough granularity to capture some of the nuance suggested by the data. We'll come to that in a minute. Perhaps more important, though, this map suggests that all female adolescents develop an eating disorder. That's a real problem. An addition of some flows to this map to represent the aging of adolescent females through the system begins to help show why not all adolescent females would develop an eating disorder. Here, I've made the simplifying assumption that all 13-year-olds enter the system without an eating disorder. And this would be a really good topic for group discussion. And we've shown that individuals age out of the system. If the flow of developing a disorder is small, then most of the adolescent females in the community will age out before or without developing a disorder. We still have the issue of insufficient granularity in the map. This map doesn't show, uh, didn't, doesn't draw attention to those adolescents who are subthreshold, that is, who do not meet the di diagnostic criteria and therefore could be considered at risk, nor does it examine or capture treatment dynamics. The data suggests that a small portion of those with eating disorders have been treated. Is this because they aren't diagnosed or because of bottlenecks in treatment capacity? 
Here's a revised structure that provides a more granular picture of the system. In this map, we've added some important structure. We've added an at-risk pool, which we're taking to be the sub-threshold adolescents, and that's about 4% of the surveyed population. We've added a downstream treatment dynamic set of pools So we can distinguish between those who have been diagnosed but not yet treated, those under treatment, and those who are formally treated. At any point in time, we could in concept do a census of adolescent females in our community to determine the distribution among these different buckets. And that distribution might help to inform policy responses. Maps like these are great ways to support productive conversation. The process of talking stakeholders through a map like this and eliciting their input can help to build everyone's understanding and can support a richer picture of the structure of the system. It can also force you back to look at evidence about the real system, which is always a good thing to do. As you see here, I've used fill levels to represent and provide a bit of sense for the relative size of the different buckets. Most of the adolescent girls in this community did not exhibit an eating disorder, so I've just left that stock unfilled. For the other stocks, we used some simple systems reasoning to help fill in the stocks and to get a sense for the size of the flows. The basic idea here is to consider what it takes for a stock to be in balance. Its inflows must be offset by its outflows. So, when considering that people spend only five years as adolescents, ages 13 to 18, we're able to use some of the estimates about the size of the sub-threshold sub and eating disordered populations to come to some plausible relative sizes for the different stocks. Starting at the right, it appears that the treated pools, either under treatment or formerly treat treated, are very small, only 16% of 4%. That's not very much. The small treated population implies that very few people are starting treatment. If we assume that treatment occurs very quickly after diagnosis for a heating, eating disorder, then it's likely that the diagnosed but not yet treated pool is very small as well. So the implication of these pieces of reasoning is that we have a relatively large undiagnosed pool and a relatively large at-risk pool with likely small flows of diagnosing and entering treatment. It's possible, but beyond the scope of this set of webinars, to use a formal simulation to arrive at defensible numbers for the rate of becoming at risk, developing a disorder, and the like. Given this distribution, we can begin to think about potential points of leverage in the system. Two are suggested by the large volumes in those two stocks, the pool of at-risk females. What might we productively do to productively reduce the size of this pool? The undiagnosed pool. How might we speed diagnosis and effective treatment? Let's take a look at each of these potential points of leverage. For the at-risk pool, it seems like we may have been missing an important point of leverage. What if we could pull people from the at-risk pool back into the first pool? Make them without an eating disorder. This may be possible, and it's suggestive of an important point. You can change the magnitude of a stock by acting either on its inflow or on its outflow. In this case, adding a flow back to the first stock gives us some policy space to consider both reducing the inflow of becoming at risk and the flow of increasing the outflow back to those without an eating disorder. Now there's another way to remove the at-risk pool by speeding the development of the full-blown disorder. That's not a good idea. We may want to constrain that flow if possible. Now, although many schools are overburdened with multiple challenges, those who interact with adolescents may have great potential to be a focal point for reducing the flow of becoming at risk and, excuse me, may have a, a great potential to be a focal point for reducing the flow of at risk 
and increasing the flow back from the at-risk pool through the adoption and the use of evidence-based resources. Curriculum materials are readily available at low cost, and these could be integrated into health classes at the high school, for example. At the middle school level, best practices training, perhaps for volunteer coaches or for physical education teachers, might help to enculturate the use of evidence-based resources in the community. For the undiagnosed pool of adolescent females with eating disorders, a critical concern is the diagnosis process. How might we support improved recognition of the signs and symptoms and support movement toward diagnosis and then back into effective treatment? It's important to identify and, if possible, remove bottlenecks along the pathway to diagnosis and then to treatment. A perhaps unexpected but important outcome of the adoption of evidence-based resources by those involved in working with youth is an increased sensitivity towards the signals that an individual may have an eating disorder. As suggested here, that increased sensitivity in turn could facilitate movement toward diagnosis. There's a great discussion to be had about how to facilitate this set of activities. From a policy perspective, this may be low-hanging fruit. But it's important for diagnosed individuals to get into treatment. The relatively small number of adolescents who are under treatment or who have been treat treatment, treated may suggest that there's an underdeveloped accessibility or affordability of treatment options. It may be important to develop that capacity in order to treat eating disorders effectively. However, it's important to note that reductions in the risk pool could reduce the requirements for this capacity. You may need less treatment capacity simply because fewer individuals are developing an eating disorder. The map suggests that you might be able to solve these downstream problems by working around and working and focusing on at-risk students. There's a lot in this student project that I haven't covered. But the example has illustrated how the interplay between mapping and evidence can help to build confidence in one's assessment of the current state of affairs for a systems problem. In this hypothetical case, the map and the data indicate, first, a relatively large pool of at-risk individuals. That is, people who are below the threshold of diagnosis but potentially with a problem the second, another relatively large pool of undiagnosed adolescent females with an eating disorder. Finally, because of the low level of treated individuals, possibly limited resources for effectively treating the disorder. And the, the analysis suggests that there may be some leverage here. Working with those who work with youth has great potential, as evidence-based resource use gets baked into the youth culture. There's another more detailed map to be developed here, but the simple structure suggests that those in education may have potential to support a reduced influx into the at-risk pool, an increased outflux from at-risk, as well as increased diagnosis. Further downstream, build out of an affordable and effective uh, accessible treatment infrastructure could support effective treatment of currently undiagnosed patients. As I think about the potential outcomes of these initiatives, it seems possible that prevention-based initiatives may be of greatest leverage and may ameliorate to some extent the need for treatment by fixing the problem before it happens. In the real world, as opposed to our hypothetical community, these initiatives might be tough to pull off. Educators face many competing demands on their time and energy, and it would be important to engage these stakeholders in the sustained application of evidence-based resources. And on the infrastructure side, it's not at all clear how long it would take to improve diagnostic and treatment capacity. Treatment can be expensive and can have stigma attached. How might we develop this capacity in today's budget-constrained world? Addressing these challenges could form the basis for additional thinking and systems, bringing in relevant stakeholders and co-creating a desired future. 
We're now going to shift gears a bit, and we'll turn to an application that came out of a Thinking in Systems workshop held at CC CDC earlier in 2017. I'll hand things over now to Dr. Jennifer Kaminsky. Thank you, Steve, for that introduction and, and for how instrumental you've been in moving our work forward using these systems thinking tools. Thanks also to James and others in Prado who allowed our work to benefit from yours and for inviting me to share our story of applying systems thinking to our challenging issue. I'd first like to give a quick background on my team to give you a sense of context for this work. I am the team lead for the Child Development Studies team in the National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities. Our team has a rather broad portfolio of work, including potentially all aspects of children's mental health. Through surveillance and etiologic research, we characterize children's mental disorders, co-occurring conditions, and risk and protective factors. We support the development, validation, and refinement of measures to facilitate earlier diagnosis. We develop evidence and tools to connect more families to evidence-based prevention and treatment. And through our partners, we disseminate evidence-based programs and information to professionals and families. We have specific appropriations for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD, and for Tourette Syndrome. We also have more general child development funding that we use for both prevention-related work and for treatment-related work. Our vision is to build healthier futures for children with or at risk for mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders. Some of you may remember that our work on supporting recommended treatment for young children with ADHD was adopted as one of CDC's later winnable battles. That work centered around the Professional Academy's recommendations that the first line of treatment for children under six years with ADHD should be behavior therapy rather than medication. In this age group, the type of behavior therapy with the strongest evidence base is parent behavior therapy, in which parents learn techniques and skills that they can use in their everyday interactions to help their young child with ADHD. And although a number of well-validated parent behavior therapy programs exist, they're not widely available, even in metropolitan areas. Medicaid claims data from 2012 provided evidence suggesting that fewer than half of young children with ADHD had received any psychological services in the previous year, a category that includes evidence-based parent behavior therapy and other non-evidence-based therapies. Our goal was to identify ways to support best practices for these vulnerable children and families. Our approach to helping improve that alignment between current practice and best practice included three focus areas shown here at the top. Developing evidence and tools to connect more families to evidence-based treatment, informing policy decisions to guide best practices, and increasing awareness of behavior therapy as the first-line treatment for children with ADHD. The case study I'm describing today fits under our focus area of informing policy decisions. One early aspect of that focus area was a cooperative agreement through the OSTILTS 13-1302 mechanism to change lab solutions, in which we set out to examine policy approaches to guide physicians towards best prescribing practices. In their first year, we worked with Change Lab to examine the impact of medication-related policies, a relatively narrow focus on a single set of policy levers. In the second year, we shifted to identifying policies that could influence the availability, affordability, and accessibility of evidence-based parent behavior therapy. In other words, the policies influencing the system that determines whether or not families receive parent behavior therapy. That system includes families, schools, therapists, referring health care providers, employers, and payers, hence a complex challenge. 
Our preliminary review of the published literature revealed a set of studies on individual policies and aspects of the system by which children and families receive behavioral health services, with no clear consensus to guide where we should focus our work. With limited resources, but high motivation to have an impact, we needed to identify the most critical pain points and key levers in the system. I put this challenge to Change Lab Solutions, who had just come from meeting with Prado about their systems thinking work. Change Lab suggested that we explore coordinating our work with Prado to use system thinking approaches to identify the policy levers we should focus on first. As it happens, I was already familiar with systems thinking, having participated in the systems thinking facilitation trainings that PPEO has orchestrated. So I recognized how valuable those tools could be for our project, specifically a stock and flow map of the system that serves young children with mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders and their families. In April, we brought together 10 experts from relevant professional organizations, education, children's hospitals, child mental health policy experts, licensed behavioral health providers, and other relevant federal agencies. We selected these participants because we knew they already worked at the system level, either in research, policy, or practice. We specifically selected experts who were not siloed thinkers. On day one, in order to make best use of our day and a half with them, Steve only spent an hour going over the basic stock and flow mapping concepts for them rather than the longer time we might have spent on that with experts not already immersed in a particular system. Next, we presented them with a draft stock and flow map we had developed as a conversation starter. They then broke into small groups to discuss what needed to be added, deleted, or changed to make it a more accurate representation of the influences on the number of families of young children who receive behavior therapy. That generated extremely rich and deep discussions, just as we hoped. We did not want them to rubber stamp the map. We wanted them to tear it down if needed and build it back up so that we had an accurate representation of the major stocks and flows at work in this system. During the second half day, Steve presented a revised map to generate additional suggestions and revisions. We then asked participants to tell us where specifically in the system they thought the most powerful levers might be and places where additional research is most needed. That discussion produced a broad set of research questions and topics, such as supporting value-based payments, family-friendly workplace policies, and perceived obstacles related to data privacy policies. Interestingly, a recurring theme in participant comments was to ask why we were not looking at upstream prevention, given that we are the CDC. In other work, of course we're trying to identify effective policies and programs to prevent impairment from mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders. We are considering replicating this process with a somewhat different set of experts to map and identify levers within the prevention system that reaches families of young children. The map shown here is presented as final only in that this is the last version we asked Steve to represent in a formal stock and flow figure. I'll walk through it and unpack it a bit for you now as it contains a lot of information in small type. The shaded path in the middle in blue is a relatively simple main chain of the type that Steve presented. From left to right, that path shows families' journeys through the system from when the child develops symptoms to the parents being able to use evidence-based parent behavior therapy skills. At various points in that main chain, other systems influence the main chain. And those are displayed as simple one-way arrows between one main chain and another. The top right purple boxes represent the stock of nearby therapists who are using evidence-based practices or using non-evidence-based practices. 
which will influence how many families have access to evidence-based behavior therapy. In gray at the top left of the slide, you can see the influences of other adults in the community who can identify symptoms and thus facilitate getting a child diagnosed and referred for treatment. In green on the left, you can see the chain describing primary care providers' motivation and ability to refer to evidence-based behavior therapy. It shows that providers might have both the ability and motivation to refer, the ability, but not the motivation, the motivation, but not the ability, or neither the motivation nor the ability to refer to evidence-based treatment. Similarly, in the middle of the blue main chain in four gray boxes, you can see families' willingness and ability to participate in training. Families might be both willing and able to participate, be willing but not able, be able but not willing, or be neither willing nor able to participate in evidence-based treatment. At the bottom left in dark red, healthcare payers' coverage of evidence-based beha behavior therapy or not is shown. In pink at the bottom right, you can see the representation of employers' support of parent attendance in training, or employers not supporting parent attendance in evidence-based treatment. Each of the flows represents an opportunity for a policy or an other intervention, such as increasing the supply of therapists who provide evidence-based treatment. In another map with type too small to read in a presentation, we've also overlaid potential policy approaches onto the map at the location of possible influence. These policies include telehealth, value-based payments, workplace policies, parity, school-based services, workforce development, and behavioral health integration into pediatric primary care. Some appear likely to influence only a small sector of the system, while the location and scope of others suggest the potential for much larger impact. Our work now is to start chipping away at the gaps in evidence we found and identifying the highest leverage point. In addition to telling this story today, I was also asked to share why this approach worked well for our complex problem. We saw many benefits, some of which I've, I've outlined here. First, the mapping process helped us clarify our understanding of the system and our goals for the larger work to influence that system. Two, we spent minimal time talking to the workshop participants and more time listening. So participants were quickly engaged in giving us their thinking rather than passively listening and potentially losing interest. Three, because we specifically asked them to improve the map, participants could safely disagree with our original map and be completely open with their suggestions. Or, having a starter map focused their disagreements on the stocks and flows on the map, rather than disagreeing with each other. Five, we made it clear throughout that the goal was not to produce the perfect system map. Rather, the goal was to give everyone in the room a common frame and a common language with which to talk about the system and about possible policy influences on the system. Six, the approach seems to have succeeded in engaging participants who all wanted to attend a follow-up conference call to talk more concretely about our next immediate steps. Four of the participants continued to work with us as collaborators, not as awardees, on follow-up activities, and the others continue to ask how they can stay engaged. What happened next? I'm grateful that shortly after the workshop, I was invited to come describe our systems thinking experience to this year's Policy Academy class. Preparing for that presentation coalesced my own thinking about the experience and provided me with a solid foundation from which to subsequently present at an audience including First Lady Rosalind Carter. There, I presented a very simple main chain map 
along with potential policy approaches that could be considered here in Georgia. Many of those attendees followed up with me to say how clearly it had laid out the family's journey through the system and the influences that can support or hinder families' receipt of evidence-based treatment. So what are our next steps now? Based on the perspectives of participants in our workshop, we've begun several new activities with the recently awarded funds in the end of fiscal year 17. With Change Lab Solutions, we're planning to develop issue or policy briefs on data and information systems to support value-based reimbursement and data privacy policies such as HIPAA and FERPA. To follow through on our assertion that prevention has a role to play, we're working with Change Lab to examine the impact of preventive policies on children's mental health outcomes. With two of the workshop attendees, we're collaborating on analyses of the role of federally qualified health centers in providing children's mental health services. And finally, we're providing support to the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine to develop pediatric healthcare quality measures that can be used as deliverables in a value-based reimbursement environment. I can honestly say that none of these activities would have been generated by our team alone or without having worked through a stock and flow map with our experts. As we've reached out to others about these new activities, the response has consistently been that there's a huge need to tackle these issues. So we feel this was a very successful approach to identify where we can best spend our limited resources to help more families of young children get connected to evidence-based treatment. I have my acknowledges listed here, and as well, I'd like to thank all of you for your time uh, and allowing me to share how we use systems thinking. And now I will pass it back to Steve to wrap us up. Okay, so this is Jen's con contact information, and uh, let's, uh, let's wrap up. So this is the last time you'll see this diagram in this webinar series, I promise. And I find it helpful, though, to keep it in my mind's eye as I work on systems issues. To summarize, systems thinking is a process. It supports productive thinking and development of policy responses through the application of a very practical skill set. Using the tools and approaches that I've outlined in this webinar series and that Dr. Kaminsky just showed, you have some potential to add some real value, whether you're working on your own or in a group setting. While the examples in this series have focused on public health, the framework can be productively applied to a very, very broad set of issues in a very wide range of contexts. I think this stuff can be useful, and I'm eager for you to build your skills in thinking in systems. I'd love to hear how it goes for you. So give it a shot. Build your baseline skills using the low impact aerobics that I outlined in the first webinar. Get things going with the conversational starters from the second webinar, and try your hand at a more fully developed map. The case studies that we presented here today are suggestive of what's possible. Okay, that's it. Please use the following contact information if you have questions or if you want to let us know how it's going for you. Health Policy News at cdc.gov.